We'll be turning to Luke chapter 1 this evening, in Luke chapter 1, reading from verse 26 tonight. I'm going to preach a message this evening titled, Mary Worship, and I'm just going to give you a brief overview of some things that uh, I believe are important for us to understand when we look at the subject of Catholicism. And I want to begin here with one verse. I'm actually going to read from verse 26, but verse 28 is going to be our text tonight. The veneration of Mary, uh, in other words, the fact that she was, it is taught that she was born without sin, lived without sin, died without sin, ascended into heaven without sin, and reigns at this present time as the Queen of Heaven without sin. Now, there has been an evolution of the veneration of Mary for many, many centuries. This did not happen overnight. As a matter of fact, Newsweek magazine, August 1997, said Mary has changed the Trinity into a holy quartet. Mary is viewed as the spouse of the Holy Spirit, the mother of the of the Son and the daughter of the Father, and even an outsider looking in can see that she is treated as a fourth member of the Godhead. And that is a very, very true statement. Now notice as we read tonight, reading from verse 26, And in the sixth month the angel Gabriel was sent from God into a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin and spouse, to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee, blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be, The angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And, of course, he talks to her about the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, tonight we thank you for another privilege that you've given us to assemble together. Lord, we do ask your blessings upon the reading of your word tonight. We pray that you speak to our hearts. We thank you for this day, for this time that you've given us the privilege to pray together, to preach, to fellowship and to sing the songs of Zion, which in Jesus Christ's name we pray, Amen, and you may be seated. Now, the evolution of Mary worship is seen throughout the centuries. And there is much uh, devotion given to her in shrines and statues, icons, pictures and prayers and doctrines. She is actually called by the Catholic Church a number of names. She is called the Queen of Heaven, Queen of the Apostles, Queen of Angels, Door of Paradise, Gate of Heaven, Mother of Grace, the Second Eve, and Our Life, just a few names that are given to her. As a matter of fact, it's interesting that she is referred to as the Queen of Heaven. And as I get toward the end of this message, I'm going to say a little bit more about the Queen of Heaven. The only time that you find the Queen of Heaven mentioned in the Scriptures is in the book of Jeremiah. You'll find it in Jeremiah chapter 7 and verse 18, and also in Jeremiah chapter 44, verses 17 through 19, and God judges and condemns the nation of Israel for worshiping the Queen of Heaven. That's the only time you find that phrase. The only place that you'll find it in the Bible, and it's associated with paganism. Now, I gave you uh, an outline. I have the outline on the board this evening, seven things. This is why we're going to be brief. You know it takes me 75 minutes to go through a three-point message, much less a seven. We're going to talk about this evening, number one, the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception. Number two, the doctrine of her permanent sinlessness. Number three, the doctrine of perpetual virginity. Number four, the doctrine of assumption or ascension. Number five, the doctrine of praying to Mary. Number six, the doctrine of apparitions. 
And number seven, the doctrine of Mary as co-redeemer. And when we get finished, I have one of these young men here to hand these out. This is another uh, article and uh, that I'll give to you that's talking about Mary, era versus truth. And, it's, and so it's got several Scripture verses and some quotes from the Catholic Catechism. And I have the Catechism laying here on the pulpit if you want to look at it. And we'll let them quote themselves and tell us what they believe. Now, as we come to this passage, I want to read verse 28 one more time. But let me give you just a few quotes uh, in reference to Mary as the Queen of Heaven. Pope Pius XII, he proclaimed Mary as Queen of Heaven, and he said her body was raised from the grave shortly after death and taken to heaven and enthroned as the Queen of Heaven. Now, the things we're going to be talking about tonight and these doctrines, you cannot find one of these doctrines in Holy Scripture. They're fables. They're stories that are made up. The Vatican, number two documents, dogmatic constitution of the church, says that she was exalted as queen of the universe by the Lord she, so she might be more fully conformed to her Son. Mary is queen by grace, by divine kinship, by conquest, and by singular voice, and her domain is as vast as that of her Son and God, for nothing is exempt from her dominion. And this is taken, again, from uh, uh, William G. Most, Our Lady After Vatican two, page 16, 17, 34, and 36. Now, in the text that we've chosen to begin with this evening, and dealing with Mary worship, you'll notice here that he says in verse 28, And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. And notice he said, Blessed art thou among, not above, but among women. Now we honor Mary's position that she holds in history. And the very fact that God chose this young maiden, uh, this, this is a wonderful thing. We don't take anything away from that. By the way, there is one woman in the Bible in Judges 5 and verse 24 where it says that she was exalted above women. You can read about that. And at Jael, and she was uh, blessed above women, the Bible says, because that she had drove a tent peg through a king's head and took his life. So you can read that and look at that. But Mary was a woman that was blessed of God, chosen of God. Uh, she was a virgin. She did not remain a virgin throughout her entire life, as we'll see. But she was blessed among women because that God had chose her a very special place. But again, these seven doctrines that I have here written out on the board this evening are doctrines that are going outside of Holy Scripture uh, to try to teach. Now, we'll let the Catechism speak as much as we possibly can. We'll use the Scriptures, obviously, this evening. And then we will, I'll give you as many quotes as we can in the short time uh, that we have. Now, I want you to notice another verse in this chapter. Notice with me as we come down to verse 47. Now, this first thing on our list this evening is the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception. I want you to understand that this doctrine, many misunderstand this doctrine, this doctrine of the Immaculate Conception has nothing to do with the birth of of the Lord Jesus Christ. It has to do with the birth of Mary. And many misunderstand this. They miss uh, the point uh, in this. But I want you to notice that as we come to verse uh, 47, verse 46 and verse 47, I want you to see here that Mary was born in sin, just like you and I and everyone else in history. 
from Adam and Eve until now, and she needed a Savior. The Bible said in verse 46, And Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. She needed a Savior, just like you and I tonight need a Savior. Notice uh, with me as we turn to Romans chapter 5. And if you're taking notes tonight under this section, the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception, you can write down Luke uh, chapter 2 verses 21 through 23 and also Leviticus chapter 12 verses 2 through 8. And you'll find in those verses that Mary was a sinner. After that she had gave birth to the Lord Jesus Christ, she needed purification from her sins. You can read about that and compare it with the Old Testament. Now, they, the Catholic Church even goes as far as saying that she was exempt not only from sin, but also that she did not even have sorrow in giving birth. In other words, there was no birth pains or sorrow or anything associated with it, as the Bible says in Genesis chapter 3 and in verse 16. In other words, she, they claimed that she did not have pain in childbirth. Well, she had a number of children, and I'll guarantee you there was a certain amount of pain associated with that. Now, as we come to the book of Romans, I'm going to be reading here, in uh, chapter 5, I'm going to take one verse, and I want you to see in this verse that Mary is not exempt from the sin nature as the Catholic Church teaches that she is. Now, you notice with me as we read from Romans 5, and let, by the way, let me give you a quote here. This doctrine of the Immaculate Conception was pronounced on December the 8th, 1854. It took quite a few years to get this one in place, all right? By Pope Pius IX, that Mary was preserved and free from all stain of original sin, she was divine, and her birth was supernatural. Now, here's a quote from the document. It says, Mary was preserved by immaculate conception when conceived in her mother's body, and was miraculously free from pollution of sin inherited from Adam. She was in soul and body holy, sinless, stainless, undefiled, pure, innocent. The same Pope damned all who reject this doctrine. Here's another quote. Hence, if anyone shall dare which God forbid to think otherwise than has been defined by us, Let him understand that he is condemned by his own judgment, that he has suffered shipwreck in the faith, that he has separated from the unity of the church. In other words, he would be excommunicated, or she, from the church if they denied the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception that became a dogma of the church in 1854. So, You either believe this or you're put out of the church and you're considered as a heretic on your way to hell. Now, I turn to this passage, and I want you to notice with me as we come here. In Romans chapter 5, I'm going to be reading in verse 12. Now, this here is very clear to you and I that we are sinners by nature, that is, by birth. He said, Wherefore this by one man... Sin entered into the world, and death by sin, yeah, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Everyone outside of the Lord Jesus Christ was born in sin, and everyone dies, and everyone needs a Savior. Notice in Romans chapter 3. Now, let's move smoothly through this this evening and quickly. The second here is the doctrine of her permanent sinlessness. Sinlessness. That is, she was not only born without sin, but she continued throughout her life in a sinless state 
until death. Now, the Roman Catholic Catechism from 1994, page 490, number 2030, says the church finds its example of holiness and recognizes its model and source in the all-holy Virgin Mary. She's called All-Holy Mary. She is called the second Eve as Jesus Christ is called the second Adam. In other words, no sin and not even pain in childbirth. Again, these doctrines, you have to go outside of the Scripture to find them. Now, I'm going to read in Romans 3, but the Bible said in Revelation 15:4, talking about the Lord, for thou only art holy. That excludes you and I and also Mary. In Revelation 5.12, Jesus is the only person who was found worthy to open the book, the only sinless one. In Psalms 51 and verse 5, David cried out, and he said, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin uh, did my mother conceive me. Galatians 3 and verse 22 says, The Scripture hath concluded all under sin. Psalms 39 and verse 5 says, Every man at his best state is altogether a vanity, and there are many, many more verses that say the same thing. Now, we're coming to the doctrine of her permanent sinlessness, and we're reading in Romans now, in chapter 3, and you'll notice with me, first of all, in Romans chapter 3, we're going to be reading in uh, verse 10, and then in verse 23, very familiar passages to you this evening. It says, as it is written... There is none righteous, no, not one. In verse 23, he said, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We all need a Savior. Mary needed a Savior. Turn with me, please, back to the book of Matthew, or in Matthew, and let's go to chapter 1 this time. In Matthew, notice with me in chapter 1. Now, the perpetual virginity, backing up to that just for a moment, uh, well, I guess we're coming to that, aren't we? Let's see, we got the Immaculate Conception, uh, the permanent sinlessness. Oh yeah, number, th- number three, I'm sorry, perpetual virginity. Let's come uh, to this in Matthew chapter 1. Now let me give you a quote before I go to the Scripture. Uh, this is a doctrine that Mary remained a virgin throughout her entire life. Now, this was held in the 6th century and made a dogma in the 7th century, around 649, under Pope Martin I. And here's a quote, and it says, Mary gave birth in miraculous fashion without any opening of her womb and injury to her body and without pain. Now, this is an actual quote. See, we, we've come now. I want you to notice the progression in the doctrines that I have written on the board. We began with her birth. And her life, we're talking about now her life, perpetual virginity. And as you move through this from her birth unto her ascension. And we're going to see as we get down to number six, she's still appearing, by the way, uh, to people in her sinless uh, perfection. She's still appearing around the globe. And then we've come to the last uh, thing here, number seven, Mary as co-redeemer. There's been a a big push, and especially in recent years, to make her equal with the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's been in her in their writings for many, many years. So, in other words, we're making her out to be a redeemer. Now, talking about the doctrine of perpetual virginity, uh, and I got so many quotes here. The reason I'm hesitant, I'm, I'm trying to decide what I will quote and what I will not. One, one of their sources in the writings say, mentions the glorious ever Virgin Mary. The Catechism on page 265, I believe I have here the 1994 Catechism. It says that just as the rays of the sun penetrate without breaking or injuring in the least the solid substance of glass, so after a like but more exacted manner did Jesus Christ come forth from His mother's womb without injury 
to her maternal virginity. Another quote says, The church calls her the Blessed Mary, even virgin, the virgin of virgins, and all holy ever virgin, mother of God. Another quote says, Following the birth of Jesus, Mary remained an immaculate and perpetual virgin, abstaining from all sexual relations with her husband. Well, we're going to look at this and just see if this is so as we come to this passage. Now, you'll notice that as we come to Matthew chapter 1, I'm going to begin reading in verse 18. We're going to read from verse 18 down through verse 25. Now, before I read, to give you just a few other verses, we know that in Acts 1 and verse 14, the Bible mentions the Lord's brethren or brothers. And they're mentioned several times. They're mentioned in 1 Corinthians 9 verse 5, chapter 15 and verse 7. They're mentioned in Acts 15 and verse 21. In Galatians and 1 and verse 19, and a number of other places. As a matter of fact, in the Old Testament, in Psalm 69, 8, there's a prophecy about Jesus Christ. He would be alien to His mother's children. His mother's children. Now think about that. Most believe that as a prophecy about the Lord Jesus Christ. In John chapter 7 and verse 5 speaks of Jesus' brothers as not believing in Him until later on after His resurrection. We do find them believing afterwards. Now what the Catholic Church, they've got a number of different things that they do. One of the things they like to do is change uh, this and say, well these, you know, talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, He did not have brothers and sisters, these were cousins. Now, the Bible mentions his brothers and sisters. I know you're familiar with that. And that passage is in Mark chapter 13, verses 55 and verse 56. Uh, It's Matthew. Did I say Matthew or Mark? Okay, it's in Matthew. It's in Mark also, but it's in Matthew 13, verse 55 and 56. And then they're mentioned in Matthew 12. Verse 46 through 50. I got too many verses before me here tonight and too many quotes. But uh, it's, it's mentioned in Mark and Luke and Matthew. It mentioned a number of places. Now, Jesus had brothers and sisters, and he distinguished between blood, blood brothers and faith brothers. I guess I could put it that way, or brothers of faith. He made a distinction between them uh, when he spoke. Now, As we come to this passage here in Matthew 1, I want you to notice as we begin reading in verse 18, and you don't have to change or distort or twist Scriptures, just believe what Scriptures say. It's very clear in these verses that after that Jesus was born, Mary was a virgin before. After that Jesus was born, that her and her husband had marital relationships together. It's very clear as we read through these verses. In verse 18, you'll notice with me that he said, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, now notice the wording. He says, Before they came together. Now why put that in there if they never did come together? You would be better off to put in there... uh, Mary was a spouse to Joseph, and they never came together. I mean, that would be the best way to put it, would it not? And so it says, Mary was a spouse to Joseph. Before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. And she's called a virgin in verse 23. Those things are very clear and plain. Now, verse 19 says, Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, and not willing to make her a public example, was mindful to put her away privately. But while he thought on these things, notice the angel came. The angel explained to him that uh, that this was of the Holy Ghost in verse 19. And then in verse 21, she and she shall bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus, and he shall save his people from their sins. Now as you come to verse 
23, it says, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son. They shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel had bidden him and took unto him his wife. The Bible says, And knew her not. Again, that word knew, as in Genesis 4, 1, it has to do with sexual relations and a marriage. And he said, And knew her not. What's the next word? You wouldn't put that in there if they never had any relations at all whatsoever. And it says, And knew her not till she had brought forth her... Now, this is another important word also, firstborn. Indicating there's a secondborn and maybe a thirdborn and so forth. But it said, And knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he said, and he called rather his name Jesus. So we have a number of words in here that clearly show you and I that uh, that Mary was a virgin, conceived by the whole of the Holy Spirit after that Christ was born. Obviously, there was marital relations because the Bible even tells us in First Corinthians uh, chapter seven that it is wrong to withhold our bodies from our spouse. And so, the Bible also says, as I mentioned a moment ago, if you'll turn with me to Matthew chapter 13, the Bible tells us here, Matthew chapter 13, we see in verse 55, and I'm just going to cut in to the text, and as I said a moment ago, there's this cousin theory. Well, the Greek word for brother and cousin are not the same. And neither is the English word here in the New Testament. As a matter of fact, the word cousin is used with Elizabeth and Mary in Luke chapter 1 and verse 36. I think that's the only time the word is probably used in the entire Bible. Now, I've never checked that, but I believe that's so. And so that theory is not going to work. And it's not going to fly because the Bible doesn't say that. But they're finagling a way to try to make their doctrine uh, make Scripture, rather, fit their doctrine. Now, you'll notice here in chapter 13, we have these words. I'm going to be reading in chapter uh, 13, and I'm going to be reading verse 55 and verse 56. And it said, Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary, and his brethren, James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas, and his sisters, plural, are they not all with us? Whence then hath this man all these things? And then if you were to back up into chapter 12, you have these words in chapter 12. And again, this is mentioned in John, it's mentioned in Luke, it's mentioned in Mark. But you back up in chapter 12, and you'll notice with me in verse 46, And while he yet talked to the people, behold, his mother and his brethren stood without, desiring to speak with him, then one of uh, one said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren stand without, desiring to speak with thee. And he answered and said unto him that told him, said, Who is my mother, and who is my brethren? And he stretched forth his disciples, his hands rather toward his disciples. So you know he's not talking about his disciples, the believers, when he mentions uh, the mother and the brethren there, and said, Behold, my mother. And my brethren, for whosoever shall do the will of my Father, which is in heaven, the same is my brother and sister and mother. Again, uh, there's a distortion of Scripture to try to preach the perpetual virginity. And we have in these verses that we have just read that there's uh, four brothers that are mentioned and at least two sisters And if you just stop right there, including the Lord Jesus Christ, there's seven children that are in this family. I mean, if you just stop it right there, we know that for sure. So there is no such thing as a doctrine of perpetual virginity that is revealed to us in Holy Scripture. This is a fable. It is a story. It is fabricated. It is a lie that the Catholic Church has given to its people uh, and to the world. Now, I want you to turn with me 
to 1 Timothy chapter 6. And uh, we've got to keep moving here. Again, I'm looking over uh, my quotes, and I'm not going to give you everything, but I'm going to give you a few more quotes as we, as we move on. But notice with me now, as we come to the fourth doctrine, I'm only about to get ahead of myself there a moment ago, the fourth doctrine is the doctrine of the assumption or the ascension of Mary. Now, we talk about the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ. And He did live without sin. And uh, He did ascend into heaven. But what about Mary? Now, notice as we come to this, uh, to this passage, the doctrine of the Assumption. This was made a doctrine by Pope Pius XII in 1950, proclaiming that Mary's body saw no corruption, but was taken to heaven and crowned, again, here's this word, as the Queen of Heaven. Another quote is that the bodily Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary into heaven is a dogma of the divine Catholic faith. And again, there's no biblical or historical evidence to support it whatsoever. Here's another quote from a book of a Catholic author, and it says, Even her body was preserved from corruption after death, the flesh of Mary and that of Christ are one, the glory of the Son with that of His mother." St. Bernard made this proclamation, and he said, On the third day after Mary's death, the apostles found Mary's tomb empty. Her sacred body had been carried up to the celestial paradise. Now, you think about believing something like this. In 1994, catechism that I have laying here, it says, finally, the Immaculate Virgin, preserved free from all stain of, of the of original sin, when the course of her earthly life was finished, was taken up body and soul into heavenly glory, and exalted by the Lord as the Queen over all things, page 252 and 966. The Vatican II documents, dogmatic constitution on the church, says the Immaculate Virgin was taken up body and soul into heavenly glory when her earthly life was over. There is no Scriptures. This is false doctrine. It's heresy to the highest level. And you've got millions and millions and millions of people inside the Catholic Church and outside the Catholic Church that believes these false doctrines. Now, you'll notice as we come here to 1 Timothy chapter 6, and I'm going to read one verse. Just for time's sake, verses 13 through verse 16 is talking about the Lord Jesus Christ and Him being before Pontius Pilate, and also about Him ascending back into heaven. And you'll notice with me in verse 16, we have these words, and it says here, who only, this Lord Jesus Christ, who only, get that, who only hath immortality. Okay? Who only hath immortality dwelling in the light, which no man can approach unto, whom no man has seen, nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. Mary, as a believer, saved through the blood of Jesus Christ, has been dead for many years. Her soul and spirit are saved for the Lord, but she will not receive a glorified body until the day of resurrection, just like all the rest of the saints who has ever lived throughout the history of human uh, human history, I should say. All right, now number five. 
the doctrine of praying to Mary. Uh, turn with me, please, to um, trying to decide where to go here. Turn with me to Matthew 6. In Matthew chapter 6, I'm going to give you a couple other verses. Write down Acts 4.12. There's no other name under heaven whereby men can be saved. Only through the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And not only that, the Lord Jesus Christ told us in the book of John, told His disciples in John chapter 14, verses 13 and 14, He said, And whatsoever ye ask, you shall ask in My name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in My name, I will do it. Not Mary's name or some dead saint's name, but He said, in My name. And I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to pray to the one I know. I know Jesus. I never met Mary. And thank God she was a wonderful lady and a great saint. I don't, I don't, I don't know any of the dead saints that people pray to. I know the Lord Jesus. Okay? I spoke with Him this morning and this afternoon, and we've talked about Him all day long here in church. So I'm going to pray to the one that I know. Now, I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 6. Now, this thing about praying to Mary. Now, the church will deny some of these doctrines to some extent. If you, if you tell them, well, they're worshiping Mary, they'll say no. If they're praying to Mary, no, they say no, we just use Mary to pray unto the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I'll give you a couple of quotes here in, in just a moment. The Bible is very clear about statues and icons and, and things of that, images and all those kind of things. Very clear about that. And how we're to pray. We're, we're to pray to the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Holy Spirit. That's the way that we're to pray. And uh, we are not to pray in some saint's name or in Mary's name or anyone else's name. And again, this came about in 600 and years later, the rosary came into play somewhere around 1090 A.D. Catholics are taught to pray to Mary and she will petition her son and since she is his mother, he will answer the request for her sake. I want you to understand that in ancient Nineveh, they had a rosary. Buddhists used beads. 800 B.C., the Phoenicians had a circle of beads in worship. I'm told that some in Islam also use beads as well. I've not seen that, but have been told that. On May the 13th, 1981, a man shot Pope John Paul II. And as the ambulance carried him to the hospital... He kept praying, Mary, my mother, Mary, my mother. And I'll, I'm going to finish that quote here in just a moment when we get to this number six. In other words, he gave Mary credit later on for saving his life and even traveled to one of the shrines to do that. We're going to be reading just a few verses, the Lord's Prayer from Matthew chapter 6. Now keep in mind this evening, the most common way that Catholics venerate Mary is by saying the rosary. It is a series of prayers counted on a string of beads. A few of you used to have one. I've never owned one but some of you used to have one. A full rosary, and I've never had one. I'm quoting, I'm relying upon other sources, but a full rosary is 150 Hail Mary prayers and 15 Our Father prayers counted by beads. It is a chain with 15 sets of beads with a picture of Mary and the crucifix and repeating it, Hail Mary is repeated nine times more than the Lord's Prayer. Am I close with this? Some of you that's come out of Catholicism, am I close? Here's part of the prayer. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. 
Blessed art thou among women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. This is wicked stuff. It is vain repetition as in verse 7 and verse 8 that Jesus said, don't do. I'd hate to think that I couldn't go to the Lord and speak with Him as, I'm spe- as I would speak to one of you. To be able to just, you know, we sing about Him being a friend and a Savior and a Redeemer and all these kind of things, and it'd be a shame that we couldn't go and just sit down or kneel down and whatever and speak to Him as our Savior, as our God, as our friend, as our Lord, and as our Messiah. The Vatican II documents, dogmatic constitution of the church, has taken up to heaven. She did not lay aside this saving office, but by her manifold intercessions continues to bring us the gifts of eternal salvation. By her maternal charity, she cares for the brethren of her Son, who still journeys on earth surrounded by dangers and difficulties until they are led into their blessed home. Therefore, the Blessed Virgin is invoked in the church under the title of Advocate, Helper, Benefactress, and Mediatrix. And I, I have trouble with that last word. And when I get to the last point, I'll probably just spell it for you. I, I, I say mediator, but when it comes to the female, uh, you know, the feminine uh, aspect of that, I have trouble with that word for some reason. Now, notice as we read here the Lord's prayer. He says here in verse 9, And after this manner, therefore pray ye, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now, this is the model prayer given by the Son of God and how we are to pray unto the Father. And Mary's name is not mentioned one time. There's not one Hail Mary in this entire prayer. This is the model prayer that the Lord Jesus Christ gave to His Father. Again, praying to Mary, praying to a dead saint, you have to go outside the Scripture and dabble in paganism in order to come up with that kind of a doctrine. I want you to turn with me please now to Matthew chapter 15. In Matthew chapter 15. Alright, we're coming to number 6. The doctrine of Apparitions, that is, appearings of Mary. You see, Mary keeps appearing throughout church history. She not only ascended into heaven according to their doctrine and appeared there as the queen of heaven and she reigns, but she just keeps appearing. She descends from heaven to make herself known to people upon earth. Now, notice as we come to Matthew chapter 15. Now, millions of pilgrims, and I mean literally millions, throughout a a year, go to shrines which honor the appearings of Mary. These are all over the world. Hundreds of different appearings or apparitions that she's made over the centuries according to their doctrine. Mexico, France, Poland, Portugal, Belgium, and many other places around the world. Hundreds of times Mary is supposed to have appeared. She appears many times, now listen to me, confirming Catholic doctrine. Okay? And asking Catholics... Now, this is an exact quote from another author. 
asking Catholics to give greater devotion to her, to her now under the title of the Immaculate Heart Idea. And when you see pictures of Mary, you see her with a great big heart. How many have ever seen them? You see her with a great big heart. She appears, she's made hundreds of appearances in many places around the world, and usually she's confirming Catholic doctrine, and she's asking people to give more devotion to her and pray the rosary. And hundreds of appearances throughout the world, and these sites have become very important and very sacred, these shrines, these places. And so pilgrims go there, they go there uh, throughout the year. After Pope John Paul was shot, he made a pilgrimage to one of these shrines. And here it is. He, it says, He thanked Our Lady of Fatima for saving his life and to concentrate, consecrate rather, the entire human race to her. Now here's one quote of one of her appearings. One of her appearings, 1460, and I forget the individual she appeared to, but here's what she was supposed to have said. Whosoever shall persevere in the devotion of the Holy Rosary, I shall obtain for him full remission of the penalty and of the guilt of all his sins at the end of life. It is very easy for me because I am the mother of the King of Heaven, and He calls me full of grace. I am able to dispense freely to my children. Now, I'm turning to Matthew chapter 15. I'm going to read one verse again for time's sake. You can read the context uh, of this a little bit later. And I'm saying all this in reference. Pictures and statues and shrines and icons are an absolute violation the first and second commandment, we are not to have other gods, we're not to make graven images, we're not to bow down before them. And so this is full-fledged idolatry in the Catholic Church and associated with Mary worship. All right, now notice as we read in verse uh, uh, 8 and, well, verse eight and 9, we'll read two verses. It says in verse 8, "...this people..." draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain, in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. And that's exactly what is involved in many of the doctrines in the Catholic Church. Now, our last thing we're going to look at, I want you to turn, we're going to take three verses quickly, and we're going to close. Turn to First Timothy chapter 2. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, we're going to go to 1 Peter chapter 1 and close in John 8. Now notice 1 Timothy chapter 2, we'll read here first of all. The last thing on our list up here is the doctrine of Mary as co-redeemer. Now notice as we come to 1 Timothy chapter 2, I'm going to be reading just uh, two verses, verses 5 and 6. It said this, it says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, not the woman, but the man, Christ Jesus. And he said in verse 6, "...who gave himself, not herself, gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time." So there's one God and one mediator, and that is the man, Christ Jesus. Now turn with me to First Peter, and we'll be reading in chapter 1. First Peter, I'm going to be reading in chapter 1. We're going to take two verses from here. Now, the doctrine of Mary as co-redeemer, and uh, in other words, the female form of a mediator, Mitrix, M-E-D-I-E-T-R-I-X, or it is spelled M-E-D-I-A-T-R-E-S-S. -S. So if I pronounced that wrong, I gave you the right spelling of those two words. Christ alone is our redeemer. Christ alone is our mediator. He alone suffered and died for the sins of the world. Now, Pope Benedict the fifteenth and Pope Pius XI both call Mary the co-redeemer of humanity along with Jesus Christ. The Catholic Catechism in 
page 968 to 970 and 2277, says that Mary is the co-redeemer to whom we can trust all our cares and petitions. Uh, it also says Mary is the co-redeemer for she participated with Christ in the painful act of redemption. Page 2677 says, We should entrust ourselves to Mary, surrendering the hour of our death wholly to her care. 1994 Catechism, a quote from page 125, number 968. And I may have confused a few of the pages with the numbers, but you get the point. And this says, Being obedient, she, Mary, became the cause of salvation for herself and for the whole human race. Another quote from page five, uh, page 252, number 969 says, Taken up to heaven, she, Mary, did not lay aside this saving office, but by her manifold intercession continues to bring us the gifts of eternal life. Another quote from page 303, number 1172, says, She, Mary, is inseparably linked with the saving work of her Son. And then Pope Leo XIII lived between 1878 and 1903. I don't know that I've got that right. But he made this statement in 1891. He said, We can receive absolutely nothing nothing unless God willing it is bestowed on through Mary. Through Mary. Wicked stuff. Wicked stuff. I have several other quotes here I could give you this evening. Benedict the fifteenth said she is the seed of all divine graces. Pope Leo the thirteenth said most truly is Mary the church mother and guide the queen of the apostles. Uh, the Second Vatican Council says Mary united with Him, Jesus, in suffering as He died on the cross in an utterly singular way. She cooperated, um, cooperated by her obedience, faith, hope, and burning charity in the Savior's work of restoring supernatural life to souls. For this reason, she is a mother to us in the order of grace, Mary, of the mother of God is joined by an inseparable bond to the saving work of her son. Another quote is, Mary is God's unique channel of blessing. Christ grants all grace to mankind through her, and nothing is imparted to us except through Mary. There's many other quotes. I just gave you a few this evening. Now notice as we come to 1 Peter chapter 1, Verses 18 and 19, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by the traditions from your Father, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. We're redeemed by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is our Savior. Turn with me to John chapter 8 and we'll close here. Now coming back to the thought that I started with with the Queen of Heaven, do you agree with me tonight on just a few things I've given you that she does according to their doctrine? She reigns as the Queen of Heaven. Yes, she reigns. And now Christ came to do the Father's will, not the mother's will, amen? Now, Christ honored her, loved her, respected her. But you see what the Catholic Church has done with Mary worship? And they do worship Mary. They can tell you all they want to tell you, and they say they don't and whatever. They worship Mary. There's no way around this. They worship Mary. Now, another quote about the Queen of Heaven. This is on page... Um, 966, 971, I believe. And it says, God hath exalted Mary in heavenly glory as queen of heaven and earth. She is to be praised with special devotion. 
I was reading an article the other day, and it says that there are 47 annual feasts and festivals devoted to Mary on the Catholic Church calendar in a year. 47. She is considered the mother of God, and we know that's a lie. The Godhead has no motherhood in it. And here's another quote on page 963, 971. It says, Mary is the mother of God. In page 963, 975, Mary is the mother of the church. This is the most common title for Mary that is used in the Catholic church, is that she is the mother of God. There's nowhere in Scripture that says that. Now notice as we come and close in this passage. In John chapter 8, I was going to read a number of verses. Let me just read one verse and close this evening. John chapter 8, verse 32. Many of you got to put the memory, don't you? And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. You shall know the truth. We're talking about truth, the Word of God. And He says the truth shall make you free. I'm saying that this is false teaching. It's Mary worship. Brings people into bondage. No sense of true salvation to the Lord Jesus Christ. And again, there's been a, a movement in many years, in recent years, to make Mary equal with the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you look at the evolution of Mary worship over the centuries and put all these quotes together, you can see that in their doctrine she is made equal with the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to stop right there.